Thank you. Uh, so hello, everybody. Again, thank you for your patience. Uh, welcome to the fifth in our series of six thought leadership talks by prominent academics from our collaborative research project on the um, next generation converged digital infrastructure. Uh, and as you'll know, this is about um, large scale virtualization of our infrastructure and processes uh, to decrease costs and increase responsiveness uh, of the infrastructure to faster business change. Um, for what is in fact uh, a very important part of the national critical infrastructure. Uh, as we have just seen illustrated ever so more so now <clears throat> under current conditions as we sit with uh, in this virtual meeting along with uh, countless millions uh, across the UK. Um, but such an infrastructure um, has to be bedded into uh, the human world um, as part of responsive and resilient organisation. Uh, and as we relinquish more tasks and more control to computers and AI, the human computer relationship will change in deep ways. And we need to be ready for this. So the idea of this session is to uh, think through some of those uh, implications. And I'm very pleased to um, introduce uh, Philip Stiles uh, from the Judge Business School in Cambridge, uh, Senior Lecturer in Corporate Governance and Co-Director for the Centre for International HR Development. Um, and he's been looking at this area for us uh, in the project. I'll just uh, add that um, Philip is an old friend of PC, or maybe I should say uh, a friend over many years. Um, <laughs> and so he's uh, well familiar with the business and uh, we're very much looking forward, forward to your talk, Philip. Thanks, over Steve. to you. Thanks, Amelia. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Sarah, and, and to Paul for for uh, making uh, making this possible. And great to meet you all uh, on the call. Uh, as Stephen said, um, I work at the Dutch Business School and our part of this project is to look at the, the organisational aspects of the, um, of the introduction of new infrastructure. And so what I wanted to do in this session was to present some research that I, uh, my colleagues Ellen and Pradeep <clears throat> are doing at the, uh, at the Business School and really just to set some ideas out and really try to encourage a, a discussion at the end to see what you think about it because um, I think some of the ideas here that we've gleaned from from, from the literature and also from some of our primary research, I think are, are kind of provocative and um, stimulating, I hope. So I'd be very interested in everyone's thoughts about what we found. So without further ado, um, let me just maybe <clears throat> give the sense of what we're going to try and do today. So we'll try and cover quite a bit of ground, but, but <clears throat> I'll try and leave plenty of time at the end for, for, for questions. Um, as Sarah, Sarah mentioned, she's going to look at chat uh, monitor chat. If anyone has a has a really burning issue or or, or or has to come in immediately on anything I say, um, then please please do obviously please do. But um, I hope I hope to leave some time plenty of time at the end. So key things. I think we're going to look at three broad areas. One is about technology and risk, and the project itself, and look at the opportunities it presents. Um, one to build network capacity and reduce operational pr uh, process overhead. So. Um, that's number one. Secondly, really to deliver large scale automation with the ability to learn and innovate and respond rapidly. And third, to manage risk more effectively as a critical national infrastructure. And um, so I think, so that first chunk of things, we're looking at the area of risk, which has been our, one of our core areas of our research and to see why this, this initiative, this, uh, this new infrastructure will actually help in terms of risk uh, for, for BT. Um, so that's, that'll be the first thing. And then second thing, we we'll look at transitioning, because obviously you could say in our, in our parlance this is a disruptive and obviously a discontinuous technology, and so that has big implications for the organisation. And so I just want to have, make a few points about first of all the risk picture. So what is the narrative here uh, in the organisation and BT generally? Secondly, what is the architecture? So we'll take a look at the the model architecture. And six, we'll Take a look at some of our research that we're looking you know we're looking at um, some use cases in industry and some uh, thought leadership interviews with individuals just to see um, where some comparisons uh, can be made and last but not least we'll make some implications for bt itself uh, in two particular areas one is about culture and second is about training and, and probably a little bit more about hr uh, in that uh, too so that's the the, the broad the broad um, scope so let me just begin obviously in the first the first area so so i guess the first thing to say this is i'm sure our bt colleagues recognize this diagram um 
so the, the network capability, I, I guess the project here is, um, is really designed to enhance the network capability. Um, you know, from a number of points of view, one of course about flexibility and scalability, and of course, taking at, taking care of overhead, some overhead and operational processes and so on. So, um, so we just want to frame it in that way as a, you know, as a very, very big opportunity. And of course, but not to say that this is risk-free, obviously not. So we'll talk about some of the risks that attend this kind of move um, as we go through. It's a similar point would be around with the, you know, with automation to think about the ability to, you know, to learn and respond quickly. So um, I think um, one of the previous call, one of the previous talks by um, uh, Ning, uh, Professor Wang uh, and, and Harris talked about intent. And we, you know, we're looking at intent, not only obviously from the kind of technical point of view from the network, network suppliers and others, but also from a very business corporate standpoint, what, what is, what is BT and other organizations, what are they trying to do? What do the customers need and want and so on? So bringing those two kind of two pictures together and then thinking about what kind of infrastructure, how do we translate those needs, those intents? How do we put it into the infrastructure? What kind of service orchestration is needed as a result of that, um, uh, that process? And, and, um, and how do we learn from this? So those sort of feedback loops on learning, how, we, how do we control the infrastructure? How do we um, ensure that the service portfolio is, is is really benefiting everyone. Um, so again, this is really just a, a way to, to set up the promise of this, and, and the little stethoscope on the on the right is really just, you know, how do we how do we investigate the health of the system over time, not only in its design but in its ongoing um, progress. And I know one of you, one of the again one of the previous talks by Ajit, um, my colleague at Cambridge, <clears throat> talked about you know issues around um, you know around control and, and around um, you know, proactive and reactive maintenance and so on. So looking at health issues, of course, is, is a big part of this. The third point really is, um, is about, you know, this project's place in critical national infrastructure. And with a project this size and the change it entails, um, you know, obviously there are risks involved given how how central BT is to the CNI. And uh, one of the quotes from, from the government, uh, CNI definition, those critical elements of infrastructure, uh, the loss of, you know, the loss of which compromises, um, you know, could result in a major detrimental impact on the availability, integrity or delivery of essential services. <clears throat> and so anything of this kind, of course, is, is, uh, has, a, has a risk attached. And I think our, our role in the, in the project overall is just to see uh, where those risks are, and um, and organisationally, what can we do about it? Uh, maybe so. That's just a little bit of just context setting. I guess maybe first provocation possibly here is you know any any project of this kind is 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 a big change issue, and in our discussions in the projects generally um, with colleagues across the universities, um, one of the things which has emerged um, and with discussions with BT, of course. Is about actually what what seems to be happening, of course, is that we're moving towards a much more digital sense of the organisation. Um, and of course, a lot is talked about digital, but you know, it se it obviously seems as this as if BT is moving very much towards being a digital organisation. And that will entail quite a big shift. Um, I mean, that's a big shift generally for any organisation. On the left hand side, um, you've got the traditional organisation. With the you know with the pyramid and the, the silos and and so on you know when everyone recognizes that we recognize that from from the university for sure so that's very familiar to everyone and I guess what we what we expect and what we see and we'll go into some of the cases we found in a second but you know is that second second wheel that second circle if you like um, about you know this idea that you know boxes and and um, and lines won't cut it anymore, strict hierarchy won't cut it anymore. We're going to have to really be focused on action. People are going to have to work in cross-functional teams. Um, there's going to have to be failure. Uh, people are going to have to be very flexible. Uh, leadership is going to have to be empowering and so on. And, and I, you know, I think these kinds of stories, um, you know, obviously these stories are familiar and people will know these stories, I think. Um, but I think what we find is, is when we go into organizations 
and we'll see some data from telecoms generally on this. Um, the story is not great. Uh, and I'd be very interested in your view about how you think BT is faring on these on these dimensions. But overall, the story doesn't look great. So, so I think organizationally, there's there's a there's a there's a set of challenges. Which which let's take a look at what they might be. Uh, again, br briefly, our, you can you have the slides, of course, but just briefly, our our, our methodology um, has been to conduct a li literature review around culture and risk and technology and. Um, all sorts of things and, and my colleague Eleanor has been doing a fantastic job uh, because that literature is growing daily so that's kind of step one and step two I think is has been a couple of projects with thought leaders uh, on the one hand and uh, secondly with risk officers and chief technology officers on the other hand so two separate projects but both informing the same ideals um, so those two have taken place and the, and the fourth Kind of leg of this has really been some some use cases um, in logistics and construction and financial services and 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 some and, in, and insurance and other places, um, which I'll give you a flavour of in a second. So so it's been a largely qualitative piece of work to find out how people are making sense of this in organisations. Okay, so that's the first context setting piece. Um, I think the second piece would be to think about um, this transition idea. So obviously BT has has kind of made its made its bet as it were in this in this technology and like all good companies you know makes it strategic move um and i guess the big question is you know what are the transition implications of this so let me just take you through that and again um just point out maybe some thoughts particularly about risk so so when we think about risk I mean, there are there are hundreds of risk definitions. So I won't I won't give you a risk definition uh, per se. Um, you know, except you know the usual ones about hazard and when things go wrong. And uh, but not all risks are about about things going wrong. Some risks are of course about strategy. And you know, and about you know you have to risk certain things to get to get rewards and and to deliver your purpose. So some risks, of course, are very beneficial, and 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 other risks, of course, you don't want which are kind of more mainly operational risks. So this kind of broad distinction, say, between strategy and operation is, is, kind of, is usually significant. Um, and I guess just again, a quick map. I, again, these are busy slides. and I don't want to go through them all line by line, but just to give you a broad picture um, on the strategy side. Um, on the left hand side, we've got a kind of current state view and on the right hand side, more of future state view. And I guess the promise of, all, of the of the NGCDI um, is is of course that we're moving away from you know a kind of uh, a system which is 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 struggling to cope you know new demands are being placed on it customers are demanding new things um, you know that that the competitive landscape is changing um, and all the things we said before about you know in terms of operation about process you know process and other overheads and uh, simplifying the system making it more flexible more scalable and so on so we know that story on the right hand side. Um, the future story, or the, or maybe you know the, the, the near future story, is you know I've, I've been slightly bold, and, and I know Stephen won't mind that. Um, you know this is you, you know the ambition probably is to be a digital company, but certainly if, if that's um, if that doesn't sit well with people, certainly um, more stability, more scalability, cultural experiment, um, review practices can be reviewed more more efficiently. Uh, customer responsiveness is 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 more you know is 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 delivered better, and operationally, of course, uh, sorry. And one of the challenges, I guess, is um, this idea about identity, about identity. So when we think about the transition, how do we move from the left hand side to the right hand side? Some of the things to consider, of course, is about the legacy transition. How do we get on board with that? Um, secondly, are we sure that everyone's in firm agreement with all this? Uh, that's a big assumption. Um, third thing, which is a huge thing in 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 all this entire area around technology and change and, and so on, is about trust. How do we trust? Not only how do we trust the intent, but how do we trust the process uh, is a big big issue. And um, and how do we? And you know, just how do we get the culture right here? I think. And then of course we have issues about skills, future skills, um, the right way to 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 you know to staff the workplace, and so on. And um, and one of the thoughts about transition. Uh, which we'll come back to shortly is is those three little chevrons if you like um when you look at all the research on transitions 
these three items come up again and again and again. One is about shared need. And I think that it looks like to be a very clear shared need. The second one, I think, which is really interesting, and the one which is the project is trying to develop um, is about the shared story. What is the story here? Um, already you can see the story taking shape. And I know Stephen has done a lot of work in this area too. Uh, the story is taking shape about the benefits of NGCDI. Um, but again, organization wide, how can that be um, um, rolled out? And last but not least, of course, is about how do we mobilize commitment towards this? So let me just, um, just jump on a second. So the, the kind of, this point really is about the, the architecture, the architecture. Again, some of you may be familiar with this, um, but uh, for the project, this has been a guiding framework for the project. And what it shows is really some of the stages through which you know, the, uh, the autonomic system may, may develop from, from creation. In other words, how do we think about the, the system and um, what's going to be in its place and what's its scope through to the automatic operation. So the, that will be a largely human focused activity, the automation piece will be about you know, the, the design of the, of, the, of the system or the algorithms and, and those kinds of issues. And again, that's automatic, so, so largely human free, although of course humans in the loop everywhere, but largely human free. And then the self-learning from that, um, so corrective behavior controls, um, alarms and all those kinds of things. Um, and how do we learn from those things? And then last thing, of course, about the regulation or the system protection, which again, alarms would come into that, but also regulation and, and um, controls and dashboards and, and so on. So, um, so part of, part of the, 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 the template we've been working towards has been to, to flesh out some of the issues around all of those stages. And um, above all that, you see the organization strategy and governance, which I think is a very, very big part of this story. Um, so I think the the, the 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 elements in the in the actual architect, the model architecture um, are becoming more well known, and we're looking at the risks of those. Um, how this translates to how an organisation should structure itself and and develop a culture around that is is the piece in addition that we're working to. So let me just show you a little piece here. Again, it's busy, and I again it's only just meant for a quick glance, but just to say. Um, and this may link up for those of you who've seen other calls from my colleagues on these on these talks, um, just maybe to link up to those uh, talks. Um, on the left hand side going down, you, you can see the four elements of the of the architecture, creation, automatic operation, self-learning, system regulation. <clears throat> and in each of those, there's an intent, um, you know, about what what is what is supposed to be happening and, and what are we supposed to be doing. Um, in addition to that, there'll be a set of knowledge requirements, and this goes to what Stephen and colleagues at BT have talked about with the knowledge layer um, underpinning all this. But you know, what are the knowledge requirements for each of these stages? Uh, and then, of course, then it's about the risks inherent in each of these stages. Um, and then what might mitigate those risks? Or what should we have in place to, to, to make sure those risks are, are managed? And, in, and again, what we're trying to do is, is, this is a very simplified version, but what we're trying to do is to, is to, is to ensure that the, 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 the architecture of the, of the project um, is mapped out in this kind of way um, to give those kind of, those sense of things. So, so you know, you know with intent, um, my colleague uh, Ning has been talking about that, knowledge requirements. Um, other colleagues have, have, you know, throughout the project talk about that. Um, and we're looking a lot at, about the risks of these things. So that's really just a sense of, of, of what we're trying to do. So the first bit was really about the context, you know, why, why NGCDI is important in terms of the future story of, of BT and why it may you know, engender a very positive risk culture for, for BT because it's you know, reducing overheads, increasing, making better processes, making customer responsive better, and so on and so on and so on. So that, all that's very, very positive. Um, the second story really is about the architecture of, of, of the project and how risk and intent and knowledge are all bound up in one and how then we, we manage those risks attached to those, those particular things. Um, what I'll do is again, maybe uh, just to share some of the stories that we found, just to give you a sense of what, what kind of risk issues are, are being played out. And then, then we'll move more directly to the BT situation. Um, so again, just a quick quick overview. So we've looked at a number of, a number of um, 
of of industries and uh, more more than I've shown here, but I thought these might just be a, a good a good illustration. So logistics, for example, um, construction, uh, oil and gas, um, financial services. We looked at others like insurance and, and so on, um, consumer goods. So uh, you know we've looked at a range of things, and I guess each of these. Each of these industries, and we looked at various companies, which I've, I've just sort of indicated on the right, far right. Um, and there, again, there are others like Acardo and Barclays and so on. But just as, it, for example, say, um, you know, you see these dominant risks. So, you know, with logistics, uh, uh, Second Mine is, is a Cambridge company um, operating um, with, with big, big organizations, particularly uh, around the distribu distribution of, of pallets and other other kind of uh, important infrastructure for, for companies. And, um, and we've looked at Ocado and, and you see, and you see the supply chain risks here, uh, which, are, which are paramount. And, and when you go say to construction and we're looking, working uh, with Costain, you know, about project quality and oil and gas, of course, about particular, well, lots of risks, of course, but um, particularly about social demands coming along there with, with, with the environments and so on. Um, interesting with oil and gas, how they've, how, how the company we're working with, um, not Equinor, but another one, um, Equinor is, you know, the, the Norwegian, uh, used to be called Statoil, um, another organization which uh, now has um, no people on its rigs in the North Sea, which is, again, maybe a story we can pick up if you're at all interested in that kind of thing, um, uh, which brings its own risk, you can imagine. Um, and uh, and last but not least, of course, financial services, where, which is really, really, one of the really big progenitors of risk theory and practice, really that's where, if you want to see how risk is managed well, go to the financial services, organizations, insurance, banking, um, they, they've done it very, very well, particularly since 2008 and the crash. So um, just a range of things, and I'll give you just two specific examples perhaps. Um, oh no, well, before I do that, let me, let me uh, whet your appetite with the telecoms data. <laughs> um, so there was, a re there was a study done by EY um, so just to bring into the telecom sector, and maybe I'll just pause for a second here. Um, so EY did a survey in 2019 and looked at the telecom sector. Um, and I think they looked at 39 telecoms, big telecoms companies around the world. And they asked, what are your leading strategic priorities? And number one was, you know, to get better at digital. Um, and only 24 said, uh, and 24% said um, agility was on their on their minds, which is a slightly strange way to look at it, really, because one without the other is is difficult. So, and again, maybe maybe for a little provocation um, to our friends in BT on the call, um, you know, how do you, where where do you think you where do you think you would answer on that? On those dimensions. Okay, so may, I'll just leave that with you. I won't obviously. I won't invite a question right now, but we can certainly come back to that. Um, on the right-hand side is from the same survey: um, attitudes towards uh, digital skills and uh, talent. So you know, if that's a strategic priority, let's say for most, um, how are they doing with skills and talent? Um, and the answer is not really very well. If you look at the very far right. Um, you know, just this idea of, of um, you know, is, is, is our skills here a real priority? And you can see the response. And um, so there's something, something here which suggests that, you know, telecoms should be, should be really right up there in terms of moving towards a more, you know, a more digital organization and getting like digital um, skills and capabilities and so on. Um, but on the, on the, on the, on the face of it, again, this is not, this is not BT centric, of course. This is just a general survey. But on the face of the industry, it looks it, it looks it looks like there's work to be done. Oh, that's probably the best way to put it. Um, so let me just move on and give you two examples from some of our companies. So example one is the is a construction company. Again, lots of stuff on the slide. Just to simpl simplify it um, for now. Um, again, it's a kind of you know current state, future state, transition story. And I've tried just to illustrate that briefly. So they're moving from kind of turnkey projects, you know, building supermarkets for Sainsbury or Tesco or whoever, you know, as one thing or, you know, discrete bridges or whatever it might be, um, 
into becoming much more of a of a of a digital organization, much more of a service provider, a consultancy. Um, so their big move is to become a digital organization. Um, they've moved from 2,000 clients to 40 clients. So 2,000 kind of, you know, really, uh, and you know, that number is, 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 they're not the same clients, if, if you see what I mean. They, they keep, you know, dropping clients, bringing new clients in, and now they're going for long-term relationships with 40 key, key clients. And what they want is to build, a, you know, to differentiate, instead of differentiating a traditional engineering and construction skills, they want to focus on being a real digital organization. Um, it's a big risk, right? Because they're involved in big, big infrastructure projects. Um, and without, you know, without saying too much, you know, for example, like HS2. Um, so this, this really, really matters. And, um, and so the risk here is, is, is significant. The business model risk is significant because they're moving away from their traditional base to a very, very different model of working. Um, there's a big strategic risk in that. Design risk is also very difficult because if you're, if you're delivering bridges and infrastructure and railways and roads and all the rest of it, um, making sure that your, your digital capacity and, and the way you do work and your use of algorithms and AI on the site at Houston and other places um, has got to be spot on. Um, not, not least for the regulators involved. The technical model risk, similar. Um, the insurance risk, they talked a lot about insurance risk and so on. So there's a lot at stake here. The transition, I've just put two quotations here. Um, there's lots of issues with their transition. One, again, these are just very vivid quotations. So I'll just, I'll just put them up there. So one is about data. So a lot of the data in this organization and the industry generally is at a very local level and they're finding it hard to scale that up to make use of it properly. So that's one thing. So they, can they connect all the dots with their data is a really big, big story for them. The second one is about the employee mindset. And they're, they're I mean, this is an organization of engineers, uh, which is why I think I, you know, the example is, you know, maybe I hope there's some read across from this example. Um, and the, uh, the, chief, the, the chief architect of this firm said this to us, you know, that. He said, in, the, in their case, he said about 25% of the engineers really get this. They understand the strategy, they understand the need for AI and to be more digital, uh, to be wholly digital almost. Um, and the rest they're struggling with. And they're, they're doing all sorts of things about education and you know, proof of concept and use cases and all the rest of it to try and, to try and bring people along. But there seems to be an inherent skepticism about it. So even in an organization like this, or maybe particularly in an organization like this, um, the transition is is tricky. Is tricky. So that's kind of example one. Example two, I guess, would be a. Um, uh, this is a financial <coughs> sorry a financial services organization. Uh, uh, it's a it's a major bank, and um, and I just again this is um, very detailed. But all I wanted to show with this is when you get to the level of the model. Uh, of the particular system, there's a huge amount of, of, um, of uh, how you say, um, huge amounts of process around it. So when they're designing systems to, to roll out into the bank, um, what they, the first thing they have uh, as standard is what they call the project management office, the PMO. And the project management office is, is the office which actually supervises the project, um, gives the, you know, the, the terms of reference, um, gives, the, gives the kind of schedule in which the project should be behaved, the, the way it should be carried out. It gives, you know, does the timetable, all the things that a project management um, discipline should do. Um, so that sits at the top. Then in the middle, those middle boxes, what you have is the, you know, the actual work going on. <clears throat> so, um, you know, you have the conceptual review and the, you know, the data validation, you know, the, the building of the model. And of course, there's a dedicated team involved in that. But as that team is going through that, there's a third, there's a third step, which is about, you know, another team, which is involved in checking, you know, is the data being used well? Um, is the right data being sourced? Uh, any inherent biases? Um, you know, are, are we running, you know, are we design the uh, you know the specification in the right way um, you know do, do, do the algorithms look, look fine um, lots of documentation uh, lots of monitoring 
okay and we've got you know we've got schedules about how often they do this it's very very regular it's very detailed it's process heavy and i thought just just to maybe um use their word <laughs> they call this uh, an industrialized process of review and i think it's quite an interesting word because what it suggests is um that in the design of these projects and in the design of any kind of te technology in the bank um the review is very organization wide there there is there is there is a big set of infrastructure around the organization which looks at this constantly i mean this is a financial service so they're very used to this and but i think i think this is going this is a template for all organizations uh, this level of scrutiny um, because um, I think, you know, particularly in regulated organizations, this is what's going to be demanded. And, you know, again, it, and financial services has got a huge head start here because of all the regulation and all the chaos they, they've experienced recent, uh, you know, in recent years. Um, I think other organizations, other sectors are, are, are lagging um, and we'll have to catch up with this. We'll have to catch up with this. Just to give you a sense of, um, there are, again, what we see generally within organizations three three lines of defense um that's you know the front line um you know people actually working with 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 the technology the second line which is about risk and compliance and um you know those kinds of things third line would be about audit and other other bigger bigger you know more back office functions um all that very very clear demarcations highly documented processes um secondly really about the review of the risk appetite this is really a top level issue what risk appetite does the firm have that's a c-suite um issue and, and one of the things we talk about in ngcdi project is about the calibration what kind of trade-offs are the company is the company making um you know for example when bt moved into uh, television big big interesting dimension in terms of the risk appetite of the firm um third thing of course about the integrated um risk and compliance committee uh, again, I know BT have all this in place. I, I'm sure that's true. Um, what's interesting about financial services and others is just the industrialized scale of it. And last but not least, of course, external regulator. And we have some interesting stories about how companies um, interact with regulators, uh, again, on a frequent, obviously a very frequent basis. All right, so um, last thing, and I just want to pose this. I'll just be a couple of minutes, then I'd love to hear what you think about all this. Um, so the last thing is about culture and training. Um, just to come back to our diagram. <clears throat> so, you know, the story of NGCDI and, and the, the new technology is, is a very strong one, very positive one. There's a great narrative to be told, um, but it does require a transition. And obviously BT are going through that and BT are no, no strangers to transitions to say the least. So I'm sure there's huge change management capability in, in the organization. I know that was some of the work I've done with Stephen. Um, on, on, on compaction and other things. However, just to just to maybe put it out there for for our questions and just to be slightly provocative, um, if we're going to move from the left hand side to the right hand side, um, you know how how are, how how are we doing on this? So, for example, if if we are if we think about BT generally, um, is BT good at allowing people to have quick changes, flexible resources? Um, maybe even fail sometimes. You know, the mantra of digitalization is, you know, fail, fail fast and so on. Is that possible when we're talking about critical national infrastructure? Um, you know, I remember talking with, you know, we had a question by Andy Reid, you know, if BT wants to be gen, um, a, really, a, a really agile organization, how possible is this? How possible is this? Uh, second point, I guess, is, you know, hierarchy is, is less important. Um, in the in the right hand side in, in the in the future digital organization um but again you know bt obviously carries a legacy culture and and um and how how far can we move with that third point about teams um can we build teams around end-to-end -end accountability rather than put teams in silos again with the work i've done with Stephen on compaction we've seen self self-learning teams we've seen teams which can do this I guess it's just a question of degree. How how far are we away from that really scaling up across the whole organization? And last but not least, about the leadership model, which is really about you know again empowerment, flexibility, um, uh, yeah, not the commanding heights view of leadership, but more the 
the development of um, of people throughout. Uh, so that's one thing I'd love to come back to. And the second thing I'd love to come back to is this. So my final slide. Um, when we think about HR, I know we have we have several people from HR on the call, which I'm really happy about as well, because I think HR um, HR is really a crucial, crucial role in all this. Um, so just three three remarks. Brief. I'll just briefly talk to them. Talk to them. Um, so number one really is about you know if we're going to move from the left hand side to the right hand side, we're going to have to redesign roles and responsibilities to align with those objectives. Okay, and then we have to think about what might that be and of course i'm sure you're already thinking about that i know we have a colleague from working on future skills i'm sure you're a long way down that track i just want to i wonder how where the barriers might be to that second point um really about engaging the specific roles of integrators and technology innovation managers integrators have come up with it as a huge issue um, in the literature uh, about people who can connect to other people and who can explain and who can just link people together and, and this is the problem with the construction firm They've got a lot of technology experts and they've got a lot of traditional people and there's not really anyone to integrate them. Um, so that skill is particularly important. And third, and, and certainly not least, and the last thing I'll just say for now, is, um, is about the narrative here, because this is a huge change. And one thing we've learned from, from leadership and narrative and change and so on is about the compelling nature of the story. What story do we have that will really compel people to move with, with you? Um, and if you want the, the very big picture, um, what is what is going to be the BT identity after all this happens? What sort of firm is this going to be? Uh, that's a huge question, and I don't expect us to have a big answer to that today. But I thought I'd just raise it and um, and just 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 leave it there. So if I could stop there, um, and then I think we have a little bit of time for questions, which would be wonderful. Um, so if I could pause there. Thanks so much for your attention. Apologies if that was a, 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 a very brisk run through, but I hope there were some points there which might be interesting. So let me pause and if there are any questions, please. <laughs>